G'day everyone, welcome to the Open Wheels. This video, we're gonna be doing a bit of mining. Finally got up Andamuku and found some opal. Awesome, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, this video is also a dual, uh, my take on uh, giving you a bit of insight into pricing, you'll see what I mean. And first I'd just like to say thank you, Roy, from Roy's Rocks, uh, for your kind words. You've just done a great video on pricing also um, and touching on things I'm not uh, as far as different levels of profitability and where you sort of stand on a bit of a tier level in making any money out of Opal, <laughs> whether it be mining all the way through to retail. So well done on that video. Um, and I hope this one ends up complimenting it. I've uh, filmed the... <laughs> Obviously, a lot of this video that you'll see um, and edited it all. And then I just caught Roy's um, video, which is like, oh, okay, no, cool. We'll touch on different things. <laughs> um, I panicked for a moment. I'm like, oh, no, I'm just going to be repetitive. But no, it's going to be good. So, yeah, thanks for that, Roy. And everyone that was in the chat commenting and, yeah, that was good. Red eyes. <laughs> uh, red eye stones. And um, yeah, so on with this video, uh, I've just come back from Andamuka, um, just edited all the, as I said, the bit you're about to see. Um, I'm gonna show you what I found, and then to fill some gap at the end of what you're about to see, I've gotta edit in what we're gonna do with these. And you'll just watch that while you continue listening to me talk about Opal pricing. So yeah, we'll have a quick squeeze. What I have here is some concrete matrix that was in a level that it sort of had some color as we'll try to see here. I'll zoom in. A bit of green, bit of purple. Bit. That's pretty cool. Um, same with these bits. And so, yeah, we're just taking that out. And, um, <laughs> There's a really, really, really big rock that just got in the way and it sort of broke up the concrete. Um, so as I was taking the big rock out, I sort of was blacklighting at the same time and something sort of struck my eye uh, with the uh, fluorescence of opal. So I got to the torch and saw a bit of green and continued digging. and found that there was a lot of sort of a crystally mix of sand and crystal, tried to be, um, gluing this to the bottom of that rock. And that was all there was. But yeah, this is kind of pretty cool. So I'm going to get set up and we'll have a proper look at this. I'll get the water ready. Um, but here's something else that I just stumbled across. It was nothing I actually dug. I just saw that and noticed that with a black light and for all intensive purposes this is one of those rocks where it's it, it doesn't look like anything just a bunch of random rocks glued together in a concretion um, but this one little spot here lit up and I saw a bit of a let's see if we can get a good shot here a bit of a multicolour almost and little fingers coming down or maybe it's in rows it's up the top i'm not sure i haven't cleaned it up i'm not sure i will because i like that as a demonstration of always break up your rocks when mining through a level you never know what might be in it i don't think this one's going to be super valuable so i don't think it's it's going to hurt it to stay like that it's a good showpiece <laughs> I think. Got a couple of pieces like that. Here's the other piece. This was another one I've shown before where I was needling out um, the back of one tree hill and open this up. And that was in there. It continues into there. But it was sandwiched in there. It was like that. And I was just going around breaking bits of rock up everything I hit. 
uh, everything I saw like this size, I just give it a hit and it just breaks easily and you never know what you'll find inside and this one time I actually found something. So that's another demonstration of why you might want to check inside things. Now I'll get set up with the water and we'll have a quick look at what I've got here. Okay, so to start off with, I'll have a quick look at this crystal. I think there's a couple of stones that I can actually cut out of these. If I zoom in. Oh, this is a bit of matrix. This is a bit of a chip off the other piece. So this is hard matrix, not concrete. And as you can see there, it's totally different to the concrete matrix. It's more of a I'm going to use the word jemmy color to it than this. This is still nice and this will take a treatment, but it will take a uh, very rough polish or it will need to be sealed with um, resin, that's <laughs> the word, uh, as this will polish beautifully as is this stuff. So that's a hint of what we're about to see also. Now crystal has also formed in amongst it, but it's very thin. It's just little veins that obviously filtered into that host rock and I'm pretty sure this host rock is like a limestone host rock hard matrix so we'll have a look at that a bit later and here are the little bits and pieces of the matrix that I um, tried to get out but they were very yeah they're nice for a little specimen jar or something most of this That's how it sort of filters in, settles in every little crack cr and crevice <laughs> that was available. And then saturated everything else that it could if it was porous enough to have soaked in. So that's, yeah, might be a nice little bit for inlay. So this one I think I might be able to get a little stone out of. Should be something in there, maybe half carrot. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, this is the other one, I think. I'm just going to actually adjust this camera to show more of a true representation because the light's actually making this brighter and this is more green than blue. I'm not sure if that's going to change much, but yeah, it's got a lot more green in it than it is showing. The blues are there, but so is that green. So that might cut something half decent. It's very thin up at this end. Just a little bit of here. It looks pretty clean inside, except for this little chip here. We'll sort him out. Uh, but the rest of this, I think, is not much chop. Might get some little inlay bits. It's got so much sand. Um, yeah, you could cut stones have the sand just sitting in the face and call it low grade. But as you'll sort of understand the rest of this video, it's not really um, worth time. It's, you know, if, you, if you're practicing, this is probably something fun to play around with because it's got color in it, but it's not big bucks or anything like that you're going to see out of it. And the effort's a bit more than the return, unless you're making something like inlay. Some of these bits, like that. Um, that looks pretty. Oh, might be a third stone out of it yet. Maybe. That's pretty. And that's sky blue. Love it. Um, yeah. Someone's got a horn. <laughs> so yeah, that's the little bits and pieces that we're sort of drawing. These two bits. To the rock. Through there. And there. And so getting this out, sort of that broke up as it was. It's not like there was anything that could be salvaged too much, but I think, I 
think, I think, I think, this is a little bit of crystal here, and I might even be able to get a stain out of it. I haven't cleaned this up. I wanted to save it to show you. And here's the matrix part, the hard matrix. Down here, this gives me a clue that there's something in here anyway. I'm not sure on the quality and the, yeah, we'll find out shortly. And this piece was, it's like they were once one rock that got broken apart as a limestone and then opal saturated it. It's just, it doesn't look like that was actually together and then broke and then sand filled the gap. Um, hmm. I like to imagine the order of how things formed chronologically. What came first, the chicken or the egg? So, yeah. Um, this piece, so it's a really nice color in there. I'm really hoping this cleans up and that there's a solid enough piece in there to cut. And it looks like it comes through here. Now, I don't think this is a fossil of a shell or anything. Though, I'm about to probably destroy it if it is. And anyway, hopefully not. I'm just gonna, <laughs> I won't destroy it. I'm gonna carefully clean this up because one of them I may keep for myself as a specimen and a memory. So, this one I think I'm gonna start tidying up on this video and include that sort of after uh, what you'll see of the, my last mining trip um, and what I could and couldn't film. Uh, you won't see this being pulled out the ground, I'm sorry. I just had to be a secret squirrel um, for locations um, with others involved. So, nonetheless, it's from Andamuka. And we're about to find out what's what's actually under here. If it's clean or if it's just sandy all the way through. Um, and yeah, I'll include it in the end of the uh, mining trip part to you're going to see the mining trip um, in the background while I overlaid my little spiel about pricing opal. So, hope you enjoy. So, I wanted to do a video on pricing Australian opal, but I need to consider others in this industry. Um, so, based on the logic of never getting between a man and his mule, I'm not going to be able to say why anyone else prices their opal um, be it rough, cut or set, but I can explain why I priced my opal as I do. I've written a list of things to consider of any opal pricing. Things like risk both physically and financially for miners, um, pulling the stuff out the ground as inherent risks with heavy machinery, being underground and of course, the, the money you outlay initially to get mining going, even if you're not successful. Um, holes are expensive either way. Uh, it doesn't matter if you mine potch or mine colour, it still costs the same. So there's those risks for the miner to even think about going underground at all. And mine is mine, buy is buy, cut is cut, and jewel is set. Each has to pay for material, equipment, time and labour through all those stages uh, maybe make a bit of profit on top would be good then you've got to consider supply versus demand um, for pricing uh, then there's quality of the opal with all its attributes like the color the body tone pattern brightness the size uh, the weight whether it's carrots ounces or kilos um, how well it's cut if it's cut uh, what, what the cut is um, any imperfections, uh, cracks, sand, potch, picture stone, <laughs> um, in treatment, in, if the opal was treated in any way, um, sometimes even the field can come into play, um, due to things like when it comes to rarity uh, of the, uh, quality pieces. Um, pricing opal, it's also about your knowledge, the experience uh, of what the opal and the market in general, um, its past 
and performances, current demand, and how the supply chain is even going. Um, is it coping? Is it supplies high? Which it's safe, so no. <laughs> um, and this is where you come in. Depending on the role you choose, determining your position in the supply chain, um, from the miner to the retailer, um, or if you're the customer and you only buy uh, finished products. So understanding certain, these certain points uh, will grow your knowledge base, giving you more experience to decide what an appropriate price is. There are no guarantees with Opal until it's in the final state, jewelry, museums, private collection, uh, everything prior to that has inherent risks. Like the saying, don't count your chickens based on eggs laid, wait till they've hatched. Uh, I'm creating my own market outlet um, and basing it on what I know from past trial and error and successes. Uh, I can't, won't use industry logic as I'm just little old me. <laughs> Instead, I'm trying to build my own brand, uh, utilizing Opal and my skills to produce quality pieces. I'm not just mining and selling Opal, I'm not buying and selling Opal, and I'm not just buying Opal to set. I, I don't work for anyone, and everything I do is, I've outlaid. I have my costs. Um, to which I need to <laughs> price fairly though. Um, one day I can tell you my story of how I did or didn't make a success of this, but my story is still being written for now. So I can't tell people what they should or shouldn't do, only what I did or didn't do and how that turned out for me. One thing I can say confidently is that honesty, accurate information and trust are key to being successful. My approach is to personally work on my rough opal, mind or bought, and add value by using my skills to produce quality products, I hope, <laughs> um, at an appropriate price. That said, it needs to be noted why Opal is so valuable in certain cases, including rarity of specimens like fossils, rarity of colours like red through to blue, uh, the patterns uh, like harlequin or pinfire, uh, the colour combinations, uh, if it's just blue and red for instance and no other colours in between, that's nature going, I'm only going to form small ones and grow larger ones to cover the red spectrum and I'm not going to let any um, form anywhere in between in other sizes where you get the, the golds, the greens, the oranges, the, you know, it's just blue and red, that's kind of a, a rarity. Um, I like cut gemstones as in, as opposed to a carving, uh, free form uh, cut gemstones for jewellery is very highly priced because it's a gemstone and sometimes it's due to the sacrifice of what it took to cut that stone, um, as in you could have started off with a a 20 carat stone ended up having to cut it as an oval and due to its shape you've, you've lost it half to three quarters of the stone but what's left is exquisite it's perfect in human standards um, of shape and a nice dome and the cut is beautiful and the opal's beautiful and then yep you've got a really really rare piece therefore um, the collectability and aesthetic appeal and the commonality of size so some stones are you know the, the di not, not to cheapen it by this pricing but dime a dozen uh as far as you know there's quite a few of them around uh, but when they get up to larger sizes and certain patterns or colors or types of opal um they don't always come out that big and that can be you know a rarity uh opal is in a class of its own the allure mystique the beauty of opal the effect it has on humans is why it is highly sought after and highly expensive. High quality pieces demand high prices for literally that reason, demand. High quality is in low supply and for many reasons, from the ability to mine successfully to the ability to produce the final product with nothing going wrong. Um, I know I haven't touched on actual dollar prices. Uh, this is because the overall opal industry can get complicated. For example, there's on field prices, if you're able to visit an opal field and yeah, you, you're paying cash, <laughs> that's always a good thing. Um, you've got the, the wholesale market uh, prices for bulk opal, um, like if you're buying big bulk or cut stones but large quantities, therefore you might get a reduced price in a wholesale, selling it in a whole lot. So there's retail obviously there for 
prices where the shops need to make a premium to run a business. It costs illegally exporting opal to other countries where taxes like stamp duty or GST need to be paid can affect the cost of the opal once it's there. Um, and someone who's outlaid money to get it there is going to want to make the profit on it. And that's the case of, well, how common is it over there? If they're the only one you can get it from, well, they can almost ask what they want because you won't be able to get it unless you come to Australia <laughs> or a country that, yeah, sells it. Um, this basically comes down to your access to the opal markets, therefore. And uh, a, a lot of these points sort of help, I hope, form things to think about. And you need to start asking questions, whether you do it out loud or not, um, but you need to be able to answer certain criteria, if you will, on buying opal, whether it's rough or cut, or even certain jewelry. Um, is is the jeweler you know really really good at what he does i'm getting there slowly um but jewelers that have been at it for years and are really good at what they do they've got a lot of years behind them with the money they've made they've also been able to upgrade their tools and they've got a lot better equipment and therefore work more efficiently and put out a lot of great work so there's that side of it when you're buying opal it's not just the opal in jewelry it's also the jewelry um there's a lot of opal at the moment and I do encourage people to keep cutting and practicing but when it comes to the high prices it needs to be the high quality of cut and that comes down to the shape how even the dome is um, the symmetry um, how it's finished off at the back and how easily it is to be able to be set without any problems and hiccups a lot of jewelers won't in the past and probably still don't touch opal at all it's the inherent risk that if they break it yeah they don't want to have to deal with that and opal if you don't know what you're doing with it and it's cut in a way where you've got thin edges um yeah delicately it needs to be set and yeah, people just don't and won't take the risk so a lot of jewelers just won't touch opal um yeah th there's lots of things to consider and some of this will, if you start asking the questions and finding your answers, I, what your access to the market is, where you are, can you get to Australia, can you get to a field, uh, and start there and go, well, that's the cheapest I'm going to ever see it. Um, see what's going around. It, it, it's hard to explain all in this on how to, uh, pro in, 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 anything to do with pricing Opal. <laughs> Uh, when I'm sort of talking to both people who aren't interested or can't um, or don't have time to cut or mine or anything and they just like to buy finished product opal so you guys have got that price you've got the final price you've got the retail price starting a new drive <laughs> we've got a new face so now we can start digging. It got a bit dark and uh, ran out of memory space. So what you saw us doing continued. So we now have a sort of access with a ramp coming down through into here. Um, so the top of the claim's up that way. The ramp I did that washed in's down there. We've come in around here and then here. And now I'm working that face. We found the level. One of, uh, it's uh, yeah, down here somewhere. And um, we've run out of time today. There you go. It's one of the rocks. Just need some at least painted lady. There you go. So yeah, there's not much showing, not with the black light. So yeah. Next trip. Others in gonna be watching this video. Um, you're trying to buy rough and you want a good price. You wanna know and this will come with experience. You want to know if I pay 200, will I make a thousand? Um, well, it comes down to your skill. You can buy the best opal at the best deal, but if you don't do it right, well, you're not going to get paid that full stop, even if it could have been worth that. Um, then you need to read the material as it's expressed. Like you need to be able to see what you're buying, which is always best to buy in person, or if you're willing to risk 
just paying postage and going up oh, I'm gonna return it so I'm not happy I didn't like it I thought it looked good in the video or the photos then make sure the supplier is got a return policy before you even buy it just make sure look if I don't touch this can I send it back for a refund I'll pay the postage for return if I have to whatever um, and usually any decent dealer would not have a problem with that and so you, you can be sort of more secure in purchasing when you actually got it in your hand and can see it and the key is do not touch it if, if you look at it and you go I cannot see me cutting a stone that could be worth more than what I paid for this then don't take it um, don't confuse practice parcels with potch and color and low-grade material it's abundant especially from Cuba PD opal capital of the world 95% of the opal Wow that's a lot of opal uh, and so there's there's large quantities of low-grade potch color brightness of one pattern pin fire moss and um, it's just too common and, and it's not selling super quick um, so it's good for practice material for people to practice on uh, when you're practicing and you're learning uh, you're probably gonna have made mistakes look give it honestly give it five years on your first cuts <laughs> and look back on it after five years of experience if you stick it out that long and then judge what you probably could or couldn't have got for it. It's a mistake a lot of us do when we're just so happy that we've just cut an opal. Oh, it looks so pretty. And you're proud as punch of it, but you've got to then fairly compare it to exquisite, professionally cut opal and go, does it now match up to that? Um, if not, the price they're asking can't be the price you're, you're gonna ask. Um, I would view certain material cut stones as uh, a rough rub uh, and I'd pay a rough rub price. I wouldn't pay a final cut stone because I'd take it and recut it and increase the value that it could potentially get. So there's, yeah, there's, there's lots of things. It's what can you do? What can you add to it? Um, that's pricing opal is, well, now consider what time it took you, what your costs were. And if you're not working with material that's going to pay a return for that, then you need to invest a bit more. And that's what it is. You risk your money and you get rewarded when the risk pays off. Um, and of course, for starting out, don't, I don't mean don't, but try not to get too wrapped up in thinking you've got a bargain because there's a, a lot of sales, it's all for fun, it's all for practice, all for beginners, and it's to encourage people, but don't end up over, pro, uh, how can I say, sometimes it could be an auction and everyone just bids it up to a ridiculous price that probably shouldn't be paid. And sometimes, you know, everyone thought, well, someone else was about to pay it just a bit under what I was gonna pay, and I won it, yay. But it's, you no, know, you'll be probably bidding against other people that blindly, blind leading the blind type thing um, professional buyers wouldn't head to eBay to buy parcels I don't imagine um, that market is usually you know I don't know some people have got some really nice opal and probably did advertise it on there but it's not kind of known for you know this is where you're gonna get the high-end rough material where you're gonna cut a fortune so you, you've got to go upstream um, even if it's a buyer, seller, or uh, if you can somehow get in contact with a miner, but be aware that a lot of miners won't even touch the online um, thing that they're just like, no, you come to town with cash and we'll talk other than that, someone will do it and I'll sell it to him. I'm not gonna advertise what I've got all over the internet uh, for every man and his dog to know, and then know also the price I sold it for. So a lot, a lot of it's private when it comes to mining. Um, no matter what you see on TV, there's the reality of it, <laughs> as you could imagine. You know, just picture what you saw on TV and then imagine if you struck it rich in a nice bit of opal, and would you even consider going on TV um, advertising that you did? Mostly it's a private thing that you just don't want to brag about in your immediate moment. It's one thing to think, yeah, I'd love to, but when you do, I'm pretty sure it's it's not the case. And um, that way you, you stay anonymous. Otherwise, um, 
everyone would be asking, hey, can I buy some Opal off you? <laughs> and it's just, no, I don't want to be known for that. I, I did well and I sold it and that's it. So if I've sold it, it's not mine. You can talk to the person who bought it. They can brag about what they bought. And that's the way it is. Um, so if you have the chance, head to a field. It will never get any cheaper than that unless you actually go and mine it out the field successfully. Um, they, therefore, look, whoever's selling whatever they're selling is entitled to if they're fairly pricing it due to their costs and they're not asking totally ridiculous price, prices, they just need to continue in the business, which does uh, need to be supported when it comes to the miners. Um, they, they never really, really see the high, high end prices unless they found something rare and were able to privately sell that. Other than that, usually they just sell in bulk and there's plenty of money to be made after they've sold it and they won't see those prices. But if it weren't for them, there'd be no mining. Um, yeah. I can go on a bit forever, but these are the things I think I've added enough here. Start researching, look at local international prices, check out the history of what prices had been paid. And in the 1990s, there were some very high prices paid for Opal uh, and they may have overpaid back then as far as being an investment that saw a huge return straight away. But that was good for the industry. Um, some opal is still worth qu quite well, but there was a lot of overpaying. Um, so that sort of looking in history of how prices went is sort of a bit of a mislead in the 90s. Um, it's a little bit of a slump at the moment, but it's picked up greatly due to the um, Outback Opal Hunters uh, shows and a lot of the miners there that have got their channels and Facebook and putting themselves out there, pretty gutsy and um, trying to help the industry uh, awareness. So yeah, there's a lot of interest of recent, which again, can cause high prices. And it's not to say it's not worth it. Um, it's worth what someone's gonna pay for it. Don't go spending too much money um, till you've got the experience. And then once you do, you'll be able to see what is and isn't for real or whether you can or can't see a return. And uh, mostly, I think a lot of people got into it because they like Opal. And then it got caught up in the, oh, it's worth money um, side of it and then get disheartened when they're not making any money. Um, yeah, there's, there's lots of anything, everything that can um, explain all day why the price is, is this or isn't that. And I can't put a number on that price because again, I'm not sure who specifically I'm speaking to. <laughs> and therefore how to explain in uh, dollar terms what you would probably end up paying for it. Um, I will however in, in my videos when I do cut opal and finish pieces I'll actually I will put a price um, usually it'll be one that I'll end up putting up on my website um, theopalmills.com.au and uh, do sell some bits and pieces there if I haven't pre-sold a lot of what I'm actually doing on this channel is actually sold before I've finished it. Um, so it doesn't actually make it up onto the shelves as such. But I'm working on that. Um, I need another set of hands. But yeah, so I'm going to stop and just let you all absorb all what I've said. Maybe watch the video again. No. Um, if you need to remember some stuff. I hope I've covered enough in here to at least get you thinking about, okay, these are the things I need to consider. Um, I probably should, as I go, uh, when cutting open that, I'll explain like, oh, this one for this reason demands a higher price for, you know, the field, the body tone that helps the uh, brightness. It's not actually the body tone you're paying for, it's what the body tones affect on the color that you're paying for. Um, so it's not, you know, it's kind of one thing essentially. Um, and I'll explain a, a bit better why, with, even if I don't put a price on it, but why this one would 
be valuable or not or more common so it's you know you can get one from me you can get one from the guy down the road but if it's only the guy down the road that's got a specific something I don't have then he can ask what he wants so broadening your supplies looking around shopping around as they say uh, you'll understand not so much the pricing but even to make your own mind up on pricing you'll, you'll find out the availability um, and if it's just not available then a lot of people would pay a premium to get their hands on the stuff it's very alluring very as i said earlier um yeah it's just an effect we have on the humans with aesthetic appeals and beauty and opal's just got everything and uh, the rarity so yeah again i'm going to stop here i hope you're enjoying the video it's just a bit of footage from uh, this last trip i wish i could have got a lot more but i'll explain that in a minute okay so i hope that somewhat makes sense to help out some with figuring out how they're going to go out pricing their opal and that's how that turned out i think i'm going to do this one up as a specimen and maybe cut this one so it's got some really nice color in there but i like the crystal on top of here a little bit of sand under it so it's not like i can just keep cleaning it up to get clean stone out of it but yeah And these two, they sort of, a bit of water. This one sort of might cut a stone. Come on, Captain. Let's zoom in, Phil. This one might cut a little stone. Not very expensive or anything. Um, but this one, this one will certainly cut a very nice stone. I'm going to leave this video here um, and let that absorb <laughs> a lot of information to start calculating thinking, reevaluating your position, your uh, intentions with Opal, and maybe see which way you can direct your work uh, to bring it to market and to make a make a dollar off it at least it's always good when it pays for itself and you can move forward and sooner or later it's not every day everything's going to pay off like <laughs> this has been a long time coming finding something half decent um without having to pay for it <laughs> um financially from buying a parcel it's um costs but this is the return for some of those costs um coming across some material so yeah, you've got to evaluate your position. If you have to buy Opal, try and find a good supplier um, for rough, if that is. Um, a lot of, like myself, I came in wanting to really just build my own collection. That's all I really wanted. Um, uh, anything after that, this has all been an awesome ride <laughs> and may go a lot further yet. So I'm keen to do that. But it did stem from just, I like Opal. I can't afford to buy finished products. It gets quite expensive. But I did learn uh, in year 11 <laughs> how to uh, cut Opal. Thanks, Don Rankin. It's a um, pleasure to have been able to learn. And a talent that I've never forgotten. It took a while to get back to Opal cutting. <laughs> but um, yeah. Life went in all different directions, but glad I've ended up where I am. And nonetheless, building my own collection, you kind of feel you've got something nice. Sometimes I can't have nice things, <laughs> but this is one thing I can have. And you can have too. As soon as you uh, find some opal, cut for yourself, and think about what you would have had to pay had you have bought it as a finished product.
and then when you get excess i think it is it helps to um part with some of it so i like to think of it as i'm not actually selling opal we're just agreeing on a parting price <laughs> for me to part with my opal and that's true for a lot of um opal sellers that really like their opal um and don't really want to part with it for any less in certain cases so anyway lots to think about i'll leave you to it see you in the next video cheers